Hi, this is Steve Metcalf. Uh, I want to say that first and foremost, I am a proud alum of the Hart School, class of 1970. Uh, over the years, I have also held a number of administrative positions. Uh, perhaps the achievement that I'm uh, most uh, proud of is having uh, uh, started the Garmony Chamber Music Series and curated that series for its first seven years. The series, of course, still flourishing under the leadership of Larry Allen Smith. Um, when Dee Hansen asked me to write the foreword to her book uh, on Hart's Centennial, I was, of course, very honored and flattered. But I said to Dee, uh, wouldn't it be best if you got one of the Hart old timers to write that? And Dee very gently put her hand in mine and said, Steve, you are one of the heart old timers. So with that sobering realization in mind, I was happy to write this uh, and here it is. In the fall of 1964, as I was beginning my senior year of high school in Schenectady, New York, my longtime piano teacher asked me what colleges I was gonna to apply to. I said I didn't know. I knew I wanted to pursue music somehow or other, but beyond that, I didn't have much of a game plan. She said there was a school in Connecticut that I should look into. On its faculty was a pianist she knew of, and she thought he might be a good person for me to study with. The school was the Hart College of Music in Hartford, Connecticut. I had never heard of the school, but on my teacher's advice, I applied. A few months later, I drove over to Hartford to visit and to audition. Hart was part of the recently founded University of Hartford, whose grassy suburban campus had just opened a year and a half earlier. Truth to tell, in those days, it wasn't much of a campus, just a handful of buildings and a lot of lawn. But the buildings were handsome and new, and the place had an open, promising kind of feel. I had taken a couple of auditions already, and I was prepared for what I had come to assume was the standard tenor of these things. All right, tell us what you have prepared followed by, thank you, we'll let you know. By contrast, the people at heart who greeted and interviewed me were friendly, engaging. The man who listened to my audition somehow wound up talking to me about baseball and politics along with Beethoven and Poulenc. It turned out that the person my piano teacher had mentioned was no longer on the heart faculty, but the school and its welcoming vibe had made an impression on me. A couple of months later, when it came time to decide where I would go, I chose Hart. As I soon discovered, it was a place with a seemingly endless cast of vivid personalities. Among them, there was the cosmopolitan, Ferrari-driving composer Arnold Franchetti, whose father had been a friend of Puccini and who told us stories about having escaped on foot through the Alps, the fascist regime in Italy, and of having turned up later in Munich, where he took lessons with Richard Strauss. There was the stylish, pixie-like pianist and vocal coach Irene Kahn, who would joke about her vast collection of shoes one moment, and then, without missing a beat, literally, sit down at the piano and cold sight-read a thorny 20th century opera score, as if she had known it for years. There was Joseph Iadone, one of the great lute players of the 20th century and a brilliant teacher of ear training and sight singing, who nevertheless, with his shambling gait and impish mustache, looked as if he might have been a character created by Peter Sellers. There was Edward Miller, a wry and cerebral composer by day and hard swinging jazz player, valve trombone mostly, by night. Professor Miller's local standing rocketed upward, at least among some of us, when we learned that he was a good friend of legendary Mad Magazine cartoonist Don Martin. And in a different category, I can recall occasionally glimpsing the courtly Alfred A.C. Fuller, who was known around the world for having created the Fuller Brush Company. Starting in the 1930s, Fuller had become the school's principal donor and benefactor and Hart old-timers always went out of their way to acknowledge that the school would never have succeeded without him. But the dominant personality of this personality-rich school was its co-founder, and for more than half a century, its unquestioned leader, Moshe Perinov.
1895 to 1994. In the pages of this remarkable book by D. Hansen, you will come to know Uncle Moshe, as he invited the students to call him, more fully. But even to a clueless 17-year-old college freshman, it was apparent that this was an exceptional human being. His welcoming talk to the incoming students was short on conventional pleasantries. Instead, he dispensed a rapid-fire assortment of his signature homespun quips and cautions. So you, so your Aunt Matilda thinks you're a musical genius. That's wonderful, but I've got news for you. The rest of the world couldn't care less. You call yourself a musician because you know Beethoven's Fifth. Well, what about Monteverdi's Orfeo? or the piano concerto of Busoni, or the songs of Wolf. And when you learn those, come and see me. I'll give you a few hundred more. Music is a great gift, but it's a tough way to make a living. That's because the average person today doesn't know Beethoven from a ham sandwich. And there's no such thing as too much practicing. Keep going. It can always be better. The origins of the Hart School, as it was eventually renamed, could hardly have been more improbable. Briefly, in the fall of 1920, Paranoff, then a 25-year-old aspiring pianist, joined with his mentor and future father-in-law, one Julius Hart, who made his living, such as it was, as a newspaper music critic, Hart's pianist daughter Pauline, soon to be Moshe's wife, and one or two colleagues to hang their collective shingle outside Julius's residence on a leafy street in Hartford. They paid themselves pittances when they could afford to pay themselves at all. The tradition of faculty salaries that were, to use Pernoff's own word, laughable, was to continue for many years. Yet, by and by, the school managed to grow to the point where it was able to move, first to a larger house and then, in 1938, to a handsome turreted brick edifice that had previous, previously been home to the Hartford Seminary. Paranoff assembled a first-rate faculty and expanded the school's curriculum to include music education, composition, conducting, and all the other disciplines required for a proper accredited conservatory. He also brought to Hartford an astonishing procession of visiting eminences, including pianists Harold Bauer and Dame Myra Hess, violinist Isaac Stern, soprano Eileen Farrell, composers William Schumann and Aaron Copland, and scores of others. How did he do this exactly? Sheer pluck seems to have played a major role. Moshe himself once told me years ago about a phone call he made to the celebrated cellist Leonard Rose, asking if he would come up from New York to give a couple of master classes. Hearing the puny honorarium, Rose begged off. But Moshe persisted sweetening the offer with the promise of a home-cooked Jewish dinner, featuring his specialty, sautéed whitefish. Sensing that Rose might be wavering, Moshe went on to describe in detail the homemade cornmeal-based batter that he used, right down to the seasonings. Rose said he would be up before the end of the week. A hundred years is a long time, especially in musical terms. It's the amount of time between the premiere of Beethoven's Ninth and the premiere of Rhapsody in Blue. There must have been moments when Moshe and his troupe wondered if their school would make it through the next semester, much less survive for a century. We know the school's finances were particularly shaky during the Depression and World War II. According to lore, in some of those lean times, the aforementioned Mr. Fuller would be called upon to personally cover the school's end-of-year deficit. The lore says that he did so repeatedly. The decision to become part of the new University of Hartford in 1957 was pivotal, of course, the end of one era and the beginning of another. If the change meant a certain loss of independence, it also meant stability and fresh opportunities for growth. Moshe officially retired in 1971, but the school marched on. It added, it added a jazz major, overseen by the alto sax virtuoso Jackie McLean. Its opera program acquired a national reputation. It continued to host a string of name visitors, Marian Anderson, Mstislav Rostropovich, Yehudi Menuhin, Dizzy, 
Dizzy Gillespie, Carl Berm, John Cage. In the early 80s, it signed a young, unheralded string quartet to an informal residency. The group called itself the Emerson Quartet in honor of Ralph Waldo. The residency wound up lasting 21 years, during which time the group gradually took its place as the perhaps preeminent string quartet of our time. Crucially, the school officially added degree programs in dance and theater in the mid-90s. In a kind of small sub-miracle of its own, these new disciplines quickly flourished and became as much a part of the fabric of the school as music. <clears throat> and now, almost suddenly in some ways, Hart finds itself on the eve of its centennial. These days, when I'm up at the school for a meeting or event, I make a point of taking note of the sights and sounds coming from the rows of practice rooms and rehearsal spaces. I find it's as good a way as any to savor the breadth and range of the place. In recent days, walking the corridors, sometimes at the Fuller Building where the music activities are housed, and sometimes at the newer Handel Center, which is home to the dance and theater programs, I have randomly overheard a pianist struggling heroically to smooth out a passage in Chopin's heroic Polonaise. A young woman in the music theater program singing Promises, Promises. I couldn't help wondering if she knew that the artist who made that song famous, the great Dion Warwick, is a heart alum. The orchestra rehearsing the deceptively modern Fifth Symphony of Sibelius. The jazz ensemble wailing on an updated arrangement of Stevie Wonder's Sir Duke. The wind ensemble playing the heck out of Samuel Barber's Commando March. A dance class warming up to an old Gladys Knight and the Pips song. A trumpet player rehearsing that instrument's famous solo in Stravinsky's Petrushka. A violinist boldly taking on the daredevil final section of Max Brooks' Scottish fantasy. At these moments, I often think of Uncle Moshe. I can't be sure what he would have made of his school having reached the century mark. Some mixture of pride and amazement, I'm guessing. What I can say is that he would have undoubtedly stuck his head into some of these practice rooms, or come to think of it, maybe each and every one of them, and said, good, that's good. Now keep going. It can always be better.